Good morning. Good morning. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. We are here for another Sunday school. This is Winfield Pentecostal Assembly coming at you from Crown Point, Indiana. I'm the pastor, Elder Cameron Mabel. Uh, this is my wife, Evangelist Deidre Mabel, and our secretary treasurer, uh, little sister, Adrielle Mabel, home from college visiting us. Let the church say amen. Amen. We are glad to be with you today. Today is uh, April the 24th, uh, 2022. All right. You got that? Got that fixed? Excuse me. Amen. Amen. We're okay. So we're going to get started with our Sunday school. And before we do, we just want to have a few announcements. Uh, this evening, uh, we will be having uh, worship live in person services at our address in Winfield, 20, uh, 7416 East 109th Avenue in Crown Point, Indiana, in a town called Winfield, uh, in a church shared with Christ Presbyterian. Uh, so we invite you to come worship with us. Also, at that same address, every Friday evening at 7.30 p.m., we have Bible study. Uh, if you would like to reach out to us uh, and connect with us or, or communicate with us, rather, you can do so through email. Our email address is wpassembly at outlook.com. wpassembly at outlook.com. If you would like to send donations uh, or any care, anything, uh, email us at wpassembly at outlook.com for our mailing address, because our mailing address is different from our worship address. Although if we were to receive some correspondence there, it wouldn't be terribly wrong. But uh, so if you just had to send it in, you wanted to send it to 7416 East 109th Avenue, that's fine too. Uh, we will get it eventually. Uh, if you would like to uh, donate to our ministry uh, and you don't like to send checks through the mail or money orders through the mail, uh, you could go to go to givelify.com, G-I-V-E-L-I-F-Y. You can go to givelify.com or the app Givelify and look for Winfield Pentecostal Assembly and make your donation. We want to thank you for your donations. Uh, they're blessings that just keep us standing. We were just even able today to help some people that were stranded uh, on their way to Michigan. We were able to, to uh, bless them with some gas money and some food money trying to make it to Michigan. As you know, uh, times have gotten even rougher. And so your donations help to help other people. So um, we thank you for your donations. All right. I want to get to our lesson today. We're teaching out of God's Word for Life. You can get this book on PentecostalPublishingHouse.com. Um, we're uh, ministering. If, if you, and like I always say, if you have not received this book, and you are a financial supporter of the ministry of this ministry please email us and let us know so we can get this book out to you and if you are not a supporter of this ministry but you would like to keep up uh, with um the lessons as we go whether you're on facebook or youtube uh and i don't do a good job of checking the youtube comments i usually just post a video once we're done with it. Um, and I don't go back all the time and go through the YouTube comments to see if there were anything left in the comments. I don't do a good job of that. So if you're watching by way of YouTube and you would like to keep up with the lessons, let us know at WPAssembly at Outlook.com. Um, you could leave a comment, but I may not get it in a timely fashion. But if you email me, uh, I can send you and say we would like, you know, the lessons. I can send you the past lessons and the current lessons and the future lessons, but I can only send it to you in three month blocks of time. So we're currently in the spring quarter. I can only send you the spring quarter, you know, or, or the winter quarter 
or I can't send you the whole year's worth. I do have the ability to send you the lessons, but not all at one time. Uh, I'm mostly concerned with, you know, the word of God getting forth. But as I speak on the word of God and your giving, um, I don't need your money. I work for a living. And in fact, me and my wife and my daughter are some of the, are some of the biggest contributors to the ministry. So, um, we don't, we, I don't need your, your tithes and your offering. I don't use your tithes and your offerings, uh, for anything other than to help people and to pay our dues, our rent, our insurance and things that, you know, I have credentials, licenses and, um, things that I need to maintain and church dues that I need to pay for the organization that gives me my credentials and covers my ordinations. Um, those require an annual fee. And so the donations, your, your offerings and your tithes go to support the work of the ministry. It doesn't support anything else. And so, uh, you know, we had some, um, uh, 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 regulatory, uh, we had to send some money, uh, off to the state to maintain our, uh, legal structure every year. Uh, we have reports that we have to give to the state every year. And I pay people to do that because I don't know how to do it. Um, but there's a regulatory requirements that, um, though we're a nonprofit entity, we still have to maintain. And so your tithes and offerings go to maintain the work and further the work of the, the ministry as a business, uh, the bit, the ministry as a legal entity and the ministry as it touches people's lives personally. So, um, there, there's much need for your donations. Um, and, um, just in the sidebar of donations and, um, giving, um, you know, like I mentioned, we were able to bless, uh, a family, uh, that was stranded here locally. And, um, we saw them as we were out this morning, uh, coming from worship with our ministry partners, Christ Presbyterian. And we worship with them in the morning before we come and do the Sunday school. And so, um, as we were leaving, they came into the church and they were telling us that, you know, they were pretty much stranded in this way. They were running low on fuel and didn't have enough money to make it to, um, back home to Michigan. And, um, we just, you know, we didn't ask them to jump in through any hoops to qualify or what they were saying. We just gave them because the money was there because others have provided that. So when you bless the church, you allow us to reach out and bless other people. And it's very hard for me to minister to someone and tell them how much Jesus loves them and how much that he did on the cross when they are hungry or naked. Uh, when I say naked, I mean, you know, they don't have, you know, clothes or adequate clothing, or maybe they're homeless. And, and though I can't feed everyone or clothe everyone or house everyone, um, the, the donations and the offerings and the tithes give me some ability to make an impact. And so I do what I can with what we have and we do it by the pr praise and blessings of God. And so some of some that saw what we were doing commented that, you know, how do we know he's just not going to go use it on, uh, drugs and alcohol. That's not my problem. Um, he asked for help. And it's not really up to, I mean, if I wanted to, I could put some barriers in place. And I'm not saying it's not wise to, I'm not saying we shouldn't. I'm just saying in this moment of time, I wasn't led to, and I don't worry about to a great extent what people do with what the money they ask for the church for, because I really don't feel like that's what the church is supposed to do in a greater sense. Uh, I don't know how much honesty the person was exhibiting. All I know is they asked for help. The church represents help. And so I fulfilled the expectation. 
The blessing comes back to the church. The blessing comes back to those who gave. The blessing comes back to me and my family. So um, I, I get blessed regardless of what this person does with the money. And so it doesn't bother me, whatever he does, whatever people do with the, the money we donate to them, that's their business. It's between them and God. If they're dishonest, that's between them and God. If they needed it, that's between them and God. You know, it won't be said that God's people didn't help. And, and if they felt like they were doing something to get over on the church, well, that's their problem. It's not my church. It's not my problem. It's not even my church. You know, so it's God's church and this is God's house and we're God's people. And so we help God's children, regardless of what what status they have with God or what we perceive their status to be. The Bible says that sometimes we entertain angels without knowing that could have been an angel trying my faith, trying my heart to see if I had a heart that God wanted. So I don't worry about um, what a person does with the donations. Uh, it's not up to me to qualify or, to, you know, what they do. They asked for help. I was in a position to give. And most importantly, the spirit moved me and released me to give. It doesn't do that every time. Everyone that asks for money for the church doesn't always get money. Uh, they may get some type of help. They may get some type of assistance. They may get some kind of guidance. They may get some type of direction. Or they may not receive all that they asked for because the spirit wouldn't release me to give them all what they asked for. And sometimes the spirit releases me to give more than what they asked for. I follow the spirit. If the spirit say, hold your purse, I hold the purse. If the spirit say, and I'm speaking in relation to scriptures, how the scripture describes uh, money, it, it refers to it in a purse. Um, though we know culturally women carry purses, but I'm just saying if the spirit say, hold the money, I'm going to hold the money. Um, and that's how we act. That's how I deal with it. If the spirits say give, I give. If the spirits say give more than what was requested, I give more than what was requested because I'm not doing it for any other reason than to further the gospel, to, uh, bless those that may genuinely be in need and, and that it wouldn't defame the name of God and the, and his people and his institution, his bride and to receive a blessing. So, uh, when you give to this ministry, you are blessing others and you in turn are blessing yourself. So moving on to the lesson, let's have a quick word of prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, Lord, we pray that you would be with us, uh, that you would be with those that are listening and that are watching right now, that the word, your word will go forth with anointing and power. This is a very beautiful lesson. Lord, I pray that you will give us divine knowledge and understanding and relatability that uh, people could understand it and receive it and and call and cause it to be engrafted or attached to their lives. In Jesus name. Jesus Amen. Amen. So the title of the lesson is God Knows the Way. And for those of you that have been following us, uh, we had a brief break between um, uh, the Resurrection Sunday and Good Friday. I think we had a Good Friday break, too. Uh, but I know we had a Resurrection Sunday break. And so um, now we're back to where the series had left off. Uh, the series is God is with us. And I'm loving this series um, because it's talking about one of my favorite characters, um, Joseph. Joseph. So we're coming out of Genesis. Genesis, the 41st chapter. Um, verses 1 through 45, Genesis 41 and 1, Genesis 41 and 1, and it skips around a little bit, um, the lesson does, it's coming out of Genesis and it's also coming out of somewhere else. Yeah, Psalms 1 and 1. And it's coming also out of Proverbs 16 and 9. Uh, let's pull up Proverbs 16 and 9. You're going to do the focus first, first? Yeah, give me a second here. I, I didn't pre-stage the scriptures. I, I neglected to pre-stage the scriptures. Oh, okay. Proverbs... 
What's that? Sixteen and nine. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And Psalms one and one. And Psalms. Psalms 1 and 1? Yeah, Psalms 1 and 1. It's just some quick verses. We're going to read it that way. We cover everything. But the bulk of the lesson is actually is coming out of uh, Genesis 41. And so, um, what did I do wrong here? Okay, here we go. So let's just read um, Genesis 41. Oh, let's read the focus verse. And then we'll get into the text. And Pharaoh said unto the, his servants, Can we find such a one as this is, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God has showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Thou shalt be over my house, and according unto thy word, Shall all my people be ruled? Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. All right. So let's pick up the text. Genesis 41 and 1. With alternate reading. Go ahead, take, take it. Whoever got it. And we'll just pick up because I can't find it. And it came to pass... At the end of two full years, that Pharaoh dreamed, and behold, he stood by the river. And behold, there came up out of the river seven well-favored kind, and fat flushed, mm -hmm. yeah. and they fed in the meadow. And behold, seven other kind came up after them out of the river ill-favored and lean flesh and stood by the other kind upon the brink of the river. And the ill-favored and lean flesh kind did eat up the seven well-favored and the fat kind. So Pharaoh awoke and he slept and dreamed the second time and behold, seven ears of corn came up upon one stalk, rank and good. And behold, seven thin ears and behold, and behold, seven thin ears and blasted with the east wind sprung up after them. And the seven thin ears devoured the seven ranked and full ears. And Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. And it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt, and all the wise men thereof, and Pharaoh told them his dream, but there was none that could interpret them according to un, uh, interpret them unto Pharaoh. Then spake the chief butler unto Pharaoh, saying, I do remember my faults this day. Pharaoh was wroth with his servants, and put me inward in the captain of the guard's house, both me and the chief baker. And we dreamed a dream in one night, I and he. We dreamed each man according to the interpretation of his dream. And there was there with us a young man, a Hebrew, serving to the captain of the guard. And we told him, and he interpreted to us our dreams, to each man according to his dream, he did interpret. And it came to pass, as he interpreted to us, so it was. Me he restored unto my office, and him he hung. Then Pharaoh sent Hank, I'm sorry. That's okay. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him hastily out of the dungeon. And he shaved himself and changed his raiment, and came in unto Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I have dreamed a dream. And there is none that can interpret it. And I have heard say of thee that thou canst understand a dream to interpret it. And Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not in me. God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, In my dream, behold, I stood upon the bank of the river. And behold, there came up out of the river seven kind, fat flesh,
fresh and well favored, and they fed in a meadow. And behold, seven other kind came up after them, poor and very ill favored and lean flesh, such as I never saw in all the land of Egypt for badness. And the lean and the ill favored kind did eat up the first seven fat kind. And when they had eaten them up, it could not be known that they had eaten them, but they were still ill favored as at the beginning. So I awoke. And I saw in my dream, and behold, seven ears came up in one stalk, full and good. And behold, seven ears withered thin and blasted with the east wind sprung up after them. And the thin ears devolved to se devour the seven good ears. And I told this unto the magicians, but there was none that could un that could declare it to me. And Joseph said unto Pharaoh, the dream of Pharaoh is one. God have sh showed Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good kind are seven years, and the seven good ears are seven years. The dream was one. And the seven thin and ill favored kind that came up after them are seven years, and the seven empty ears blasted with the east wind shall be seven years of famine. This is the thing which I have spoken unto Pharaoh. What God is about to do, he sh showed unto Pharaoh. Behold, there come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt. And there shall arise after them seven years of famine, and all the plenty shall be forgotten in the land of Egypt, and the famine shall consume the land. And the plenty shall not be known in the land by reason of that famine following for it shall be very grievous. And for that the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice. It is because the thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. Now therefore let Pharaoh look out a man discreet and wise to set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this, and let him appoint officers over the land, and take up the fifth part of the land of Egypt in the seven plenteous years, and let them gather all the food of those good years that come, and lay up corn under the hand of Pharaoh, and let them keep food in the cities, and that food shall be. Oh, I'm sorry, I got carried away. Yeah, <laughs> wherever wherever I left off at. Thirty six. And that food shall be for store to the land against the seven years of famine, which shall be in the land of Egypt, that the land perish not through the famine. And the thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. 38. And Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a one as this? a man in whom the Spirit of God is. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God hath showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thy art. Thou shalt be over my house, and according unto thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than you, than thou. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand and put it upon Joseph's hand and astray, arrayed, arrayed, I'm sorry, arrayed him in the vestures of fine linen and put a gold chain about his neck. And he made him to ride in the second chariot which he had. And they cried before him, bow to the, bow the knee, and he made him ruler over all the land of Egypt. When Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without thee shall no man lift up his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name, what is it, Zapapenia? Zapnath. 
Benaya. Zap. Panaya. And he gave him to the wife of Asnot, the daughter of Potiphar. Potiphar, priest of. Uh, no, that's actually Pot if for Ra. Potiphar. Potiphar. Priest of On. Um, and Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. Amen. 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 So we have here the culmination of the dream that he dreamt 13 years ago. Yeah. Joseph is now 30 years old. He had the dream at 17. And for 13 years, he literally went through hell. And for 13 years, he never complained not one time. Mm -hmm. Not one time did he complain. Not one time did he lift up his voice. Did Not one time did he lift up his hand. Not one time did he say, woe's me. He only asked for help one time. He, uh, he made a complaint one time. When the, bake, the butler left, he told him, he said, listen, when you do... When you get back to the Pharaoh's house, tell him that I've, I've been done wrong. I've done nothing to deserve to be a slave. I've done nothing to deserve to be put in this prison. Remember me as the dude forgot. And so uh, you could say, <laughs> you could say that, you know, it was almost like he was doomed, but he had hope because he had a dream and he just believed in the dream mm -hmm. he just he he believed in the dream and so he applied himself wherever he was whatever situation developed his character was being developed the his ability to dream and his ability to interpret dreams he knew was not of himself he knew it. He knew it. And so he, he, that was from God. What God was going to do was already established. Uh, the, the anointing that God had placed on Joseph was already done. What needed to be developed and proven, and this only happens with time, is character. Character must be developed. A lot of times we don't see our troubles as what they really are. They're developing our character. You know, um, sometimes our troubles are because of our disobedience or uh, our lack of faith or our lack of positioning. I really honestly believe the lot of stuff that I went through was because I did not have the faith to believe God. Um, God had to wrestle me into his will. He had to align me with 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 uh with force into his will he does that to a lot of people because um we just don't believe that god is you know doing and so we have to be directed and we look at situations and we think that the situations are are pain are are, are anything but character building and god moving us and so either god is increasing our faith Aligning us in our in His will, or developing our character, and He uses He allows trouble to do it. He allows circumstances that are not that are not favorable to us to develop us, because fire is the only thing that gets out impurities. Water is the only thing that washes us clean, and so we must be purified and we must be sanctified. And whatever the will of God is for our lives, we have. In order to do it, we have to be tried because our character must go before the anointing. The anointing was on him from day one, but his character needed to be developed. His character needed to be tried. His character had to be shown. And he was, at what was developed was his faithfulness. And it wasn't just for him. It was for all of us. Because we could clearly look at him and see how we're supposed to deal with situations that are not uh, 
in our best interest, that don't feel good, that don't look good, just complete wrong. Mm. I mean, can you imagine your family selling you out? No, can you imagine your family killing you or setting you up for murder? Family, blood. If anybody's supposed to be in your corner, it should be your family, but his family was his worst enemies. Mm. And the ones that treated him kindly were people that were not even belonging to him. Isn't that paradoxically strange? Isn't that strange? Isn't that just wrong? I mean, in every single word you utter, you come up with that being wrong and triply wrong when it's the family that is setting you up for murder. When the family wants you dead. When the f your family, your brothers, hate you. Okay? That's, that's, a, that's a atrocity on a whole nother level. It's enough to hate people and enough to set people up for murder and murder them. But when your own family do it, yeah. what do you, what, what does that do to your psyche? Yeah. When, 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 when you have been uh, set up by the people you love and thought would love you the most. See, I can relate to that. I, I can relate to that personally. I can relate to that. I've been there. I know what it's like when the people you love try to kill you. Right. I know what it's like. I've had both my fa my birth father and my mother try to kill me. My birth father tried to kill me when I was in my mother's womb. And my mother, probably suffering from some form of mental illness, clearly from some form of mental illness, Tried twice in one night to kill me. And it wasn't for my stepfather, I'd be dead right now. She wasn't saved. She wasn't, you know, she didn't know God. Like I said, you know, when you don't know God, <laughs> the gamut is open for you. I love my mother, but she tried to kill me twice in one night over a math problem in the third grade. And it might be the reason why I struggle with math now. Because I have that painful memory uh, associated with numbers and math. I, I have a problem with math. Um, so I can relate. I can relate. I can completely relate to what it feels like to have the people you love the most hate you the most. You know what I'm saying? Or want you gone, want you dead, or try to kill you for whatever reason. And so there, it plays with your mind. But it didn't play with Joseph's mind. It hurt him, but he had something much more powerful to hold him. And that was Christ Almighty. That was God himself. Hallelujah. And so we find him in this situation that took 13 years to bring him as his character was being developed. Uh, the lesson commentary, uh, uh, Roman numeral one, Joseph was called before Pharaoh. You come down a, a the paragraph A, uh, three paragraphs, the third paragraph down in the middle. In the religion of Egypt, the Pharaoh was believed to be a demigod and the embodiment of the will of gods and their purpose on earth. The fact that Pharaoh was troubled by dreams and unable to interpret their meaning showed that his power as a god was severely limited. Even Pharaoh's magicians and wise men failed to interpret the dreams. A failure that foreshadowed the centuries later confrontation between Pharaoh's magician and God's chosen deliverer, Moses. Um, the reason that had to happen that way was because Joseph needed to be bought front stage. See, we don't see all that God is doing. You and me, all of us alive are going through something. And in some levels, it's painful. And in some ways, it's unbearable. And in some ways, it's fatiguing. Um... You go through and you it's like you never stop going through. It's like, when does this stop? You know, you want the pain to end. And all of us are looking for an escape from the pressure and the pain of life. Just life. 
Um, if it's not us that are in pain, then we see so much of it around us that it depresses us. If we're not necessarily in a bad place, we clearly are close to people that are. And if we're not close to people that are, we can see people that are. And so we we become we become, you know, hopeless. Mm -hmm. uh, and we want an escape from the pain. And the devil is quick to open up avenues for us to escape. Mm -hmm. Well, God's got a way of escape too. Um he told them that, you know, whatsoever is lovely, whatsoever is pure, whatsoever is of good report. He said, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. He said, his mind, your mind, my mind, our mind will he keep in perfect peace Hallelujah. if we keep our mind stayed on him. Yeah. Why? Because in, that is how we rise above the storms in our lives. That's how we get to the place where um, the things of this life does not have such an effect that we lose hope. If you lose hope, you lose forward momentum. And so um, we, we remind ourselves of the things that God has brought others through. Though we, it, we, that's why it's so important. The, what, the time you most should be coming to church is when you are going through because when you're going through the worst, because that's where you get strength and hope and encouragement. Uh, but many times people of God stop coming to church when they start having trouble because um, I guess they think the church is the play, perfect place for perfect people. And that's mm -hmm. that's not accurate. It's the perfect place for imperfect people. Oh, and so yeah. you come to church to get strength and healing to get encouragement. But oftentimes we see people drop off the radar because they think, well, you know, I'm going through, you know, my life is hell, and so I can't be saved. No, you are saved. You you are God's child, and church is the place you come through to, to get out of the situation in. I know so many people right now seem like one problem after another. But, see, they fail to realize that the one problem that God delivered from, and then another one crop up, and they, they get despondent, like, okay, man, I just got out of this fire and now I'm right back in the fire. That's because you are being refined. I mean you need to understand what is going on. Your character is being defined. Your character is being built. Your character is being uh, matured. Your character. Yep. God is trying to work something out of you Hallelujah. and create space to bring something into you. Yes. And so the fires are there to create space. Yes. And, and 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 we're never going to get to a place where we get free of it. Mm. That is the, the pipe dream. Mm. We're never getting free of it. Troubles, some people got it bad. Some people got it bad worse than others. And some people just they're just messed up. They, they life seems messed up. Mm. But those are the ones that God wants the most. Yep. God wants to treat your life like a rehab project. God wants to treat you, you know, like you watch HGTV and you see them going to a house and you look at the house and you be like, man, ain't no way I would live in a better. place like that. You know, it. you walk into it, there's, there's holes in the walls. Some houses don't even got walls. You know what I'm saying? Uh, some houses don't got floors. You know what I'm saying? You walk in, you can't see nothing. You can't see nothing. You can't see nothing. You walk in and you say, man, ain't no way in the world I live here. And then you come back six months later. And it look like a brand new house. Hello. And not only does it have floors and walls, but they're beautiful. Yeah. And not only does it got floors and walls, but it's got brand new appliances. Oh, you just loving it. Hallelujah. You just, oh man, look at this house. Look at the, look at the archit, you know, the completely different. Yes. The before and the after. And then you look at it and you say, man, look, wow. Look, I remember what this place looked like before. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. I can relate to that because I remember when we moved to Gary. 
Listen, didn't know what God was doing. See, hallelujah. I, I, you know, I don't even want to, I don't even want to, I don't even want to teach no more right now. <laughs> I just want to worship God because it just clicked to me what God was doing. You know what I'm saying? It just clicked. It just, mm-hmm. it just clicked. My parents lost their house in Chicago. Mm-hmm. I don't know how, but they did. Mm-hmm. They lost the house that we owned in Chicago. Our first house. I remember moving out of the apartment building to this big old house. Mm-hmm. And you know, to this day, I love that house. I love that house on 81st and Muskegon. I love that house. Mm-hmm. That was such a I just love that house. I just love that house, you know. Um, and I love the neighborhood. Uh, I often have so many, when I want to have a happy place, I go back to my neighborhood in that, that house. I do. And we lost that house. And my parents knew they were going to lose the house. Now, us little kids, we didn't know what was going on. We just kept driving to Indiana every weekend. And so my mother had found out about Indiana. Indiana was, we were living in Chicago. And my, Indiana was, was you know, oh, let's go to Gary. We drove to Gary, East Chicago. We drove to Hammond. And I didn't know what we were doing. Mm-hmm. They were looking for a new house. Now, they knew they were, I didn't know it then, but I later, parents later told us the house was in foreclosure. Mm-hmm. They were getting ready. To, they literally took the house from us. And my parents saw it coming, so they started to make secondary plans. So my mother finds this house in Gary on a corner of Harrison and 7th Avenue. And the house was boarded up. The house was boarded up. And my mother said, I want that house. The house had been lived in for 17 or 18 years, we were told. The realtor had been taking my parents around, but my mother found this house. I didn't know what was going on, but we moved in the house. And now I know we moved in the house illegally. We squatted. We squatted in the house because they had foreclosed the house we're in Chicago and had evicted us. And my parents didn't want us to see and experience that. So they they moved us to this house in in Gary. It was boarded up. We pulled the boards off the doors and and didn't have no heat in the middle of winter. They had no heat. But they had a working fireplace. So we lived in the living room and slept in the fi- in the living room where the fireplace was. Didn't have no water. But the neighbor next door allowed us to use their garden hose so we could have some water to flush the toilets. That, you know, just didn't have no gas or electricity. But my mother had God. She had just got saved a year prior. Uh, yeah, because the real was born. Rewa was two when we moved there. So this is 84. And my mother just got saved a year or two prior and had joined a local church in Gary. And that church had electrician. He came out and hooked up the electricity to the house, even though he wasn't supposed to. So we had some electricity. Uh, We didn't have no gas. But we had heat. And it I didn't know it, but it almost broke up my parents' marriage. I noticed that my dad wasn't there. He wasn't there. He was in Chicago at his sister's house. They had split up because of this. We had got evicted, and it was just me and my mother and my brothers and my sister wow. trying to make it work in Gary. Uh, ended up getting the house ended up closing on the house and getting the house. The house cost $17,000. $17,000. That's how much that house costs. And my dad 
I guess they worked it out and he showed up and the house had no toilets, uh, had no sinks uh, in the bathrooms. The roof, the ceilings had rusted, uh, had rut through because of uh, water leaks. The roof was bad. So when it rained, it leaked into the, the all three floors. Um, and my mother could see what it could become. My mother could see what it could become. And so me and my dad, we put in new toilets. We put in new faucets. Uh, I hung those. I hung at, at in the eighth grade. I hung the ceiling fans in the living room and in my parents' room. I hung those, those ceiling fans. Didn't know nothing about electricity. I hung those ceiling fans in the eighth grade. Uh, I sanded every single floor in that house. You see all how beautiful those floors were? How go? I sanded those floors. And I put 10 coats of varnish on it. Matter of fact, I spent my whole summer one year varnishing one time overnight. I did the whole downstairs in one night. I'm surprised I didn't get brain damage from all the fumes from the polyurethane that I, I put 10 coats of varnish down mm -hmm. in one night. Don't know how I did it, but I did. I did that. But it was vision to see what it could become. You had to see beyond. My parent, my mother could see beyond. Mm -hmm. The house is beautiful when we got through with it. Uh, we, me and my dad learned how to put up drywall. We drywalled it. Eventually got someone to fix the roof, but it took years. So then we would bucket patrol when it rained to catch the leaks from coming back through. Um, you did what you had to do. You did what you could. But the Lord blessed. See, the Lord was in the picture the whole time. He was trying our character. And so I learned valuable tools with my hands. Did not know they were going to come in later on in life. Young man, but I learned. But my mother used to always uh, remark how we move the shed. The shed used to sit as you walk along the side of the house. The shed used to face, you know how you used to walk along the side of the house and then turn to go? up the back steps. Yeah. Where the shed used to be right there where the, where the sidewalk made the turn. It used to be sitting right there facing you. Yeah. We moved it from there to the back of, back of the yard. Yeah. yeah. And my mother remarked how we did it. The backyard was a forest. Wow. There were so many trees and little saplings growing. You could not see the back fence from the porch. I cut all that down. I paved. I, I cleared all of that. And so the logs that we cut, the, the trees, the, the bigger trees that we cut down, we used them as, as, as rollers. I jacked the shed up and we put the logs that we had cut down and used them as wheels, as rollers. And we rolled the shed and then turned it 45 degrees and pitched it in the corner. My mother still says, I don't know how y'all did that. <laughs> You know, me and my dad and my brothers, we did it. And so the vision, you see what I'm saying? The ability to see what isn't there mm, by faith. Yeah. Faith lets you see what is not there. Yeah. And then God gives you the strength to make it through to get there. Yeah. Joseph had faith to see what wasn't there. And God's ordained plan was for us to come to Gary to escape what was coming to the southeast side of Chicago because they shut that mill down. And that whole side was dying. You go over there now, it's bad. Mm. My parents, God knew what was getting ready to happen and got us out of there. Right? And had I not been in Indiana, I would have never met, met her. Yeah. Would have never met her. And the history continues.
Just like Joseph. Mm -hmm. Joseph was a very small part in God's big plan. They came in a hundred, a hundred and three or three hundred people, Joseph's brothers and their wives and his father mm -hmm. and everybody, 300 some people, 400 years later, over a million. Mm -hmm. God used Egypt to incubate a nation. Mm -hmm. And God told uh, <clears throat> Jacob that it would happen that for 400 years, the people were going to be enslaved. And it happened just like God said. Mm -hmm. When he re when he redid the vision to and recanted it to Jacob, not recanted, but re repeated it, mm -hmm. he told him, Yet, yeah, but 400 years they're gonna be in bondage. Mm -hmm. But I'm gonna bring them out. And it happened just like God said. So Joseph was a little piece of the plan. Yeah. Jo he played a big role, but he was a small piece in God's big plan. It took someone like Joseph's anointed to bring them into Egypt, and it took another man anointed by God to bring them out. Hallelujah. And God had a plan. God has a plan. There's a purpose for your pain. There's a purpose for what you go through. Yeah. There's a purpose. But you can't you can't look at the ugliness of the present. You gotta by faith see the beauty of the future. Hallelujah. Ah, say no. You gotta see what God. I to say, uh -huh. you got to see what God is bringing you to. Hallelujah. You got to see past where you are. You got to see past what God, what God is trying to do. And if you can just grab on to some hope Hallelujah. by faith and know that I'm here because God got me here. I'm going through this because God got me going through this. I'm going to come out. I don't know when, but sooner or later, I got sooner or later, this has to change. It cannot remain this way. It will not remain. There is something happening here. If I could just hold on and do what I can, do the best I can, I'm going to see the end of this and it's going to be in my favor. Yeah. Um, What time is it? Looks like we're out of time. Uh, so we, we're just going to leave it there. Um, um, we're just going to leave it there. Right. Um, we're just going to leave it there. I had some other stuff I highlighted, but God took us another way. <laughs> and yeah. so we're just going to leave it there. I pray that something was said that blessed you. Um, there is no pain that we go through that is not without a purpose. God has a perfect intent for the problems we go through. And we don't have to resort to worldly ways to manage and escape our pain if we know how to give it to God. Because when we do things in a way that the world does it, we get more problems. But when we come to God with our problems, that is I'm pre actually preaching on this very topic tonight. I'm using a different text, but I'm preaching out of the same topic. Mm. Um, the same type of topic. When we use the impetus of, of the stimuli of problems, it is meant to produce a different type of result. And if we use the motivation from the problems and come to God with it rightfully, then we learn what God is doing, where we are in it, and he gives us grace to endure it. Hallelujah. So don't waste your, my, my Pastor Hines, my former pastor used to say, don't waste your pain on a pity party. Yeah. Use it as motivation to see God's face. Let that burning in your heart drive you on your knees. Hallelujah. That way you get an understanding about what you're going through. Yeah. And if it's something that you bought on yourself, guess what? His grace is still sufficient. See, now I'm all into tonight's message. His <laughs> grace is still there. Yeah. So and it, can, see, it's, it doesn't matter where you are and why you're there. You still need help to get out yeah. through the other side. And know. don't let the prayer be, Lord, take this away, because there is a purpose for your pain. Yeah. So when you understand that you're there for a reason, then you understand, okay, 
a purpose. This, there's, a, there's a purpose. Mm -hmm. And then you can say, okay, I know this is only for a season. And let it develop you. Yes. And then as it develops you, God elevates you. And establishes you and brings you out with a strong hand. I tell you, <laughs> and I'm going to stop here. I have been through, my wife have been through, and little Miss Sister Mabel been through a great deal of things. So do my other kids, but the three of us really caught it for 10 years before we started this ministry. We caught it. We caught it. And um, we just continued to let the pain perfect us and build our character. Little did I know that God was preparing us for where we are now. I look now back at the slights and the disrespect and the pains of the ministries that we were a part of and got treated so ill favoredly. And, and it felt like no matter where we went, no matter what we did, no matter what good we did. You remember, D? You remember painting the walls of the basement? Remember? Remember all the work we did? Remember all the stuff we... See, that was Joseph kind of work. When you are being attacked and you're being uh, ridiculed and, and slanderized and you did nothing wrong. Joseph went through that and what did he do? He continued to be faithful. So... As you're going through, whether you bought it on yourself or not, continue to find where God wants you to be and then perform at a level that God has brought you to. And then ask God to develop. Well, God's going to develop your character because where he wants to take you, he's not going to allow you to get there until you are fully able to be there and be successful in it. We don't understand. We're being developed. Fire removes the impurities. Okay, I'm going to stop. That's it, boys and girls. I need to stop because I'm feeling good in my soul. So uh, we thank God for another Sunday school. Uh, today is April the 24th, 2024, the day before my birthday. Thank God for another year. If I, if I see tomorrow, I thank God for it in advance. And this has been Winfield Pentecostal Assembly in Crop One, Indiana. I'm the pastor, Elder Cameron Mabel. Um, if you would like to reach out to us, do so through WPAssembly at Outlook.com. If you would like to worship in person, live, we have worship service every every Sunday evening at 5 p.m. and Bible class at every, uh, every, every Friday night at 7.30 p.m. at 7416 East 109th Avenue, Crown Point, Indiana, 46307, located in the town of Winfield, in a building with Christ Presbyterian, our ministry partners. Um, if you'd like to donate to the ministry, you can do so through the Givelify app, G-I-V-E-L-I-F-Y or G-I-V-E-L-I-F-Y dot com. Look for Winfield Pentecostal Assembly and make a donation. This has been Winfield Pentecostal Assembly in Crown Point, Indiana for Sunday School, April the 24th, 2022. We're signing off. God bless you. We'll see you next Sunday at 1230 Central Time. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.